Uh, but right now we want to welcome you for a discussion uh, with two folks who, um, who are going to talk about, about a film that's playing here at the Film Center. So let me bring down our moderator, Andrea Visconti, and our guest of the evening, John Torturo. Who's seen the film? Has anyone seen it? Oh, so some people have seen the film and some people haven't. Okay, all right, great. They've seen the movie and they're here. And they're here. <laughs> For more. <laughs> For uh, Napolitana. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Visconti. I'm a journalist with, based in New York for an Italian news organization. And uh, I guess because of the Italian connection, here I am next to John Torturro or as they call him in Italy, Joa, right? Joa. <laughs> Joa. Yeah. Actually, actually, someone, they explained to me the whole genesis. That's what they, 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 they called Giovanni sometimes as a name in, in Naples. But it's from, uh, it's, it's, it, it has a Portuguese origin. It, it's like Juan. Juan. So they say uh, Juan. And, it, and that, that's how they say it in Portuguese, and the Portuguese and Spanish were there. So that's how they, they wound up with Juan, from Juan. So that's interesting. You know, just by making reference to this uh, nickname, Juan has uh, <laughs> already brought up a very interesting point. Um, I, I think that what is fascinating about uh, this movie is that it captures Naples as a melting pot. You mentioned Portugal. It's not by coincidence that the name Joa would have a Portuguese origin. That's right. Tell us about, uh, especially being in New York, the melting pot. Tell us about a melting pot we know less about, Naples. Well, I mean, obviously it was originally a Greek city. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. Uh, and, you know, after the Romans were there, they've had, you know, just about... Maybe not as many invaders as Sicily, but pretty close. Uh, the, the Spanish ruled for a long time, uh, and there's a lot of Spanish in Neapolitan, and as there is French. There's there's Northern African uh, influence. Uh, there there's Norman. Then later on, there's uh, you know American. Uh, you just you know you you feel this you know collision, uh, this. It's a port city. It was the, the capital of the two Sicilies. Uh, you feel this whole Arabic, Middle Eastern influence, which I think was there, but was never mined that much in the music, but has come out more in the last maybe 50 years. But even Carosoni played with that, uh, Renato Carosoni. But uh, I, I, what I recognized when I was there was that it, it reminded me of New York City especially in the 70s when things were more dangerous in New York. But it, there was, seemed to be more characters on the street. Yeah, uh, and I just, you know, it's a, obviously it was a cultural center. It was a musical center, a classical musical center. And what's interesting is that people exchanged ideas from the classical to the popular world. And all these, what we think of as these folk singers or ballad, people who did ballads with a mandolin, and then they, I, I, I'm pretty sure the first guitars were made I in Napoli. Uh, so the street singers, it's something that they've always had. Their, their, their language is very musical, and it, you really feel it being sort of the granddaddy to New Orleans, to Havana, to Rio, to those kind of cities where there's a lot of poverty, then there's a wealthy community, there's, uh, there, there's, there's these universities there. Uh, but, but you know, beyond their oppression, uh, it's interesting what people say, everyone who's come here has conquered us, but when they leave, all the Neapolitans say this, they are more Neapolitan than the Neapolitans, so they can conquer us, but we absorb them. And that's their genius. They absorb them. I'm under the impression that they did something like that with you. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's very hard. I mean, my family's from Sicily and Puglia, but it's very hard. It's a very powerful city. I mean, uh, uh, Mizia, who's uh, Portuguese, who's one of the singers in the film, and she lives there sometime and, and works there, said the city is like a witch. 
It's like a witch. And I, I agree with her. I agree with her. It says, you know, because you see all the past, the problems of the past, and you almost see all the problems of the future. Uh, you know, it's a city that's way ahead of us in many ways. Uh, 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 and also, you know, it's archaic. In other words. John, for the benefit of those who have not seen the movie yet, give us a sense of the structure of the movie. I believe it's, what, 23 <laughs> Uh, songs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do they... Uh, and other little snippets of songs, too. How do, they, how do you bring them in? How did you choose them? Who are these singers? Are they well-known? Uh, are they all Neapolitan? Who are uh, they? There are people. Uh, the, many of them are Neapolitan. Uh, one's from Tunisia. Uh, one's the child of a, of a, of a black father from uh, North Carolina from World War II and a Neapolitan mother. Uh, so it's it's a it's a mixture of all different people uh, in the film. I was going to do a, a straighter documentary and just do little snippets, but once I saw the power of the performances, I, I decided I said, well, maybe you know let each performer tell their story through the song because each song uh, tells a little bit about Naples. It's it's sort of a window or a street into Naples, and sometimes in a in a song you can tell more in five minutes. And you can tell in a whole. Na uh, uh, <laughs> what's? Oops, hit the wrong. Okay. Uh, uh, wrong movie. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you can tell more uh, in five minutes than you can tell in a ninety-minute film. And so I, I started relying more on the singers, and then later on, uh, Francesco Rosi, uh, d the director, suggested that I put myself in more as a narrator because we had to go back for a few days. But uh, you know, there are songs that were written in 1300. There's a song, I think we're gonna show a clip yeah. of Come uh, Facce Tamamata, uh, which is How Your Mama Made You. And that, song, that was a sex song written in 1906. Uh, uh, the lyrics of the song is, you know, when, when your mother made, I know how your mother made you, the guy says, she rolls you in dough. And then she stuck a flower in the middle of it, and it, and it's really it has, it's it has all these sexual innuendos, and this is a new version of it by Eugenio Bonato. In fact, maybe we want to show that uh, yeah, the clip. And, yeah, you can show the clip, and the, he's leading into it. This is the chef.
Beautiful. I love this clip because it captures so many elements of Naples. First of all, the sensuality of that city. Yeah, it's a very sexy city. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Because the people kind of like look at you with a kind of a fatality that almost look like into you. Like, well, what could you really do? You know, <laughs> it's like, and uh, it's interesting because this song, we didn't really want to have Petra, you don't see her singing the song, you see her later in the movie. Uh, it was an experiment. We shot this. This is the, the uh, Palato de España. It's, it it's in the Spanish section of Naples. It was built hundreds of years ago. Uh, and the song is about how your mom made you. And I, I had two images. One is they have these dances from hundreds of years ago when people, they, they call them tarantella dances. But they were really dances of exorcisms. They would, you know, if someone had had lust on their mind or whatever, they would get it all out. You know, they would do these dances or if they were sick or whatever, and they would do it, you know, on the beach or you know, with bare feet. And so I was thinking of that when I heard the, and I was also thinking of how hard it is, you know, when a woman has to make a baby, uh, having witnessed my wife, especially my first son, you know, she was, she had this birthing bar and I was, it, you know, she looked like Hercules. It was, uh, I realized how, you know, why men are so, uh, you know, really intimidated down deep, you know, of, of, of about women. So I was talking to them and I said, listen, I really want you to be like these, like, these warrior women who are pushing the baby out. I don't want to have any of this kind of MTV kind of movement. I want everything pushed out, you know. So they were, you know, I said, this, has anyone had a baby? And they were like, no, you know. Uh, I said, well, you know, I, I didn't, you know. So I said, I'll tell you, I'll show you five moves and I'll dance a little bit, and you can, you, can, you, can, you can ape me, and then do it your own way. So I showed them a little bit, and for five minutes, next to the camera, and they just you know, went to town, and uh, we had two cameras, and, and the cameramen, a lot of these guys are really you know, macho guys, and my, one of my cameramen, who was quite a lover in his day, uh, he said he couldn't, he couldn't film it anymore. <laughs> he said, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. He said, I, so I had to film some of the, you know, the stuff that was on the ground. I was filming it. So, uh, but uh, they were fantastic. But some of those girls are dancers, and some of them are. One's a graphic designer. One's a shopkeeper. Uh, and they just said, you know, we, we want to participate. And they danced for us a little bit. We said, okay. So come on in. And we did it. There was no, there was no we didn't rehearse. We did not rehearse. We, we, they just watched. I danced with them. I talked to them a little bit off camera, and they did it. And I, I mean, not every song is like that, but it's representative of, and you can hear this, all this Arabic in the background, uh, that Bonato, Eugenio Bonato, you know, his arrangement is really fantastic. And that's a song that's over 100 years old. In fact, you, you made reference to the fact that you did not really rehearse this all that much with these girls, and that most of the movie uh, had a lot of improvisational elements. Yeah. Well, some things we did very like on a concert stage, and we did, uh, we did a lot of the songs live. And other things, you know, we didn't have time because of their schedules, so we would have to meet, and then, you know, I would have to kind of block everything out. And uh, they were just very free and easy because, you know, improvisation is the art of the poor. And they, you, they have to improvise to make it through the day, to get through the challenges of the day. And I think a lot of musicians understand this. You know, they, they, they understand that. And, this, and the city is known for its improvisation. I mean, it's a crazy city, you know? And some cities, you know, you work, they're very organized, whatever, but if you make a mistake, they can't fix it for a day. Here, if we needed something, if we needed a marching band, if we needed a costume, if we needed a dancing girl, they would appear a half an hour later. <laughs> this is how it is. I mean, this is how it is. I mean, it's just, it's one of those places that you feel really, if you're a creative person, all your senses are, you know, are on alert, on high alert, you know? I mean, we shot one musical number in a market, and we knew there were people who were selling, you know, goods that they were very, uh, uh, you know, honest, and we knew that there were cigarettes and maybe drugs. You know, we would ask people, we'd say, could we film you? 
I said, everyone said, yeah, fine, you know, no problem. <laughs> and then, you know, one guy said, can we film you? And he said, like, he said you want to shoot me? He said, no, you shoot us. He said, you know, then we shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> but, it was in, uh, but it was in Neapolitan, and I, I knew, I heard the word, it sounded like there was a shoot word in it, you know, and I said, did he say what I think he said? He said, yeah, he said, he'll shoot us. I said, okay, we're not going to shoot you. Don't worry about it, you know, no, we film this way. He said, okay, fine, no problem. So, uh, but that's how it was. So, uh, uh, but most of the people were, you know, fantastically generous. And, uh, you know, it's a really integrated uh, place. And uh, uh, I think the people, the mixture of the people, it, it, it comes out in, in, how they, uh, in how they interact with people. You know. I want to ask John another question, but I would also like to open up um, you know, the evening to your questions as well, rather than uh, we talk and then last few minutes uh, you have questions. So please feel free to think about, okay, well then let's go ahead. There was a hand up right away, why not? <laughs> My question can wait. <laughs> Well, I mean, because the corruption, you know, and, and, and the problems that they have. I mean, they live on a volcano. So they, they live, the first woman who sings the second song of the movie, not the, the opening credit song, Mina, who sings Carmela, uh, the group uh, Sp uh, uh, Spaca Neapolis 55, Monica Pinto, she sings the song Vesuvio, and she lives on the volcano. That's where she lives. And so she understands, she lives in the presence of death, you know. Uh, and so therefore, you do value other things differently because you are in the presence of death. Death is part of life. And it doesn't mean that you're depressed or morose about it. But so when she sings, you watch her and, you, I mean, she just, you know, the, the hairs on my arm just raise. I mean, she's, it's really like what you would say, what we would in America, we, we say is soul music. This is, you know, really soul music from the ground up, and that's that's what makes you uh, the connection in music universal. When people are singing out of a need, a, out of a need of, uh, you know, of expressing their the human condition. So I think because they live around that, they've also had been, a, you know, earthquakes. They've they have so much crime. They have a huge garbage problem now, and people try to navigate through the day you know i mean w for example we were trying to get a shot of the of the volcano from far away and we couldn't find it and then this, our location da, 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 da. Our, our location manager uh sabrina she found this woman who had an apartment and she just let us in and we said you know should we pay you she said no we we'll just make you some. I'll make you some coffee. Just how many people? And we hung the the cinematographer over the balcony, you know, twelve floors up to get all the the sheets and everything, and then to get the shot of the volcano. And she was just, you know, simple about everything. So the in, the human interaction is not dead, you know. And they also, uh, you know, some people are very ironic, obviously, about life because they have to be. So they just say, "Well, I have to make the best of it." No matter what happens, I kind of have to make the best of it. So it's, it's just interesting when you're around that. I think there's something that's connected to lots of countries, especially in the southern parts of countries, that is there, is, is connected to that place. You know? And uh, I don't know, I just, you, you, know, you, don't, you don't have that kind of interaction every day. And it's something to be valued. It is. Uh, whether it's just, you know, there. I mean, their espresso, I don't know, I'm, I don't want to insult where Andre's from, but they really have the best espresso in the world. Oh, they do. I mean, yeah, they do. They do. And, and once you go have espresso there, it's like a poor person's drink. You're ruined. You, you are ruined. Maybe Palermo, but they take the cup, and they have a shot glass, and I don't like it with sugar, and they rim it like a margarita. And the crema is like that thick, the espresso is that little. And when you stir it, it tastes like they say, eh, a chocolata. <laughs> and it's when you have that coffee you're like oh my god this, like, it puts everything into perspective <laughs> it's like there's, there's not that many things better than that really <laughs> you know what I mean and uh, you know 
John, I think that the image many of us have is of Naples, a city where music is everywhere. It's part of everyday life. Yeah. Is it so? I, I think the, certainly it was so because, you know, music originally, you know, was, didn't have radio stations. They didn't have records. So the, the way songs spread, the, the people spread it. You know, they spread it by playing it or by singing it. And that was a place that a lot of music was created and spread. Uh, but uh, the older generations, like if you sing a song, they'll, they'll finish it for you. There's still there's neo-melodic, there's hip-hop. You know, obviously, America has a big influence there, too. But when you hear them speak, it does sound like they're singing a lot of the times. You know, it's, that's how they, it's, it's their language. You know, it's... And... Uh, so it's still there. And in fact, there's a couple of moments in the movie when you see people basically standing yeah. at a corner just singing. See, so if you sing like the first part of Luna Rosa, you know, say, you know, hey, Luna Rosa, my palate, and you know, someone will come right in and, and do the next phrase. You know what I mean? You know, uh, they'll, 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 they'll finish the next phrase for you, you know. Uh, but it, it's a, it's a theatrical city, you know, it is. It's a city that every, when you go to a press conference there, <laughs> You're like, you can't believe it. You have to say like, this looks like 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 somebody cast it, like central casting. <laughs> and, uh, you, you, I've never seen a press conference like that in my life. I mean, people, they're so individual. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, it's for example, I, I went into his, I was doing a play there five years ago, and a guy recognized me. He was a butcher. So he said, oh, you're John Tutor. Of course, that John Tutor. I said, yeah, John Tutor. I said, ah, I really love you. I love you, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, thank you very much. So he grabbed my arm, and he pulled me next door to the baker. And he said, you know, Giuseppe, he said, where's that John Tutor? You know? And Giuseppe looked at me and said, bah, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to Giuseppe, he said, like, you don't know who he is? No, 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 uh, he said, you're so stupid. He said, you're so stupid. He said, I, for years, he goes, I knew you were stupid, but now I know you're really stupid. <laughs> Ignorant. This is his neighbor. You know, he's so stupid. He said, I'll take you to the next place. Don't worry, we leave him. <laughs> Takes me to the next place. The next guy didn't recognize me either. And, and then I said, listen, you got to let me go. You have to let, you got to let me go. You know, yeah, yeah. And he was all worked up in a lather when I left. I was like, Wow, I was just like you know, being in an acting mm. class, you know. It was really, <laughs> he wanted what he wanted, you know. And so, I, it's nice to have that in, during the day, to have a little bit of that. And so it really, I found it because they're musicians too. I mean, let's face it, a musician can do. It's like you know, like actors go and they watch athletes. A musician could do what what people dream about when they're a good musician, and it takes you out of yourself. We have, a, we have a microphone for questions. Just one second. Um, so did you um, grow up always having a connection to Italy? And did you speak Italian when you were young? And when did that all start for you? My father came when he was six years old. So he didn't really speak in his dialect to us very much because he wanted to become Americanized. He was the first... He came here and he met his father. His father had left when his mother was pregnant. So he was six when he met his father. So we didn't, we listened to a lot of Italian music, but we listened to, you know, jazz and, you know, the kids listened to soul music and R&B and rock and roll and, you know, so it was a mixture of sounds. But that was one of the sounds. My mother really didn't speak Sicilian because her mother died when she was a kid. And she was raised by Irish nuns from four to ten. So they did, they forbid her to speak her language. So she didn't, she didn't want to speak it anymore when she got out of the home that she was in. Uh, so, but I, the, the music, I grew up around a lot of opera and you know, certain popular so singers. But I didn't know songs like Tama Morigata Nira in the movie. You know, Maruzella I heard, maybe Mala Femina I heard. There are certain Neapolitan s songs I heard. But you know, I didn't want to do all of those, all of them. You know, I wanted to do the ones that some classics but also things that were our classics there you know or things that i think are interesting so i would imagine that neapolitans would be very leery of uh, trusting a uh, half sicilian yeah. half uh, pugliese uh, american guy how did you do it 
Well, I worked there in the theater. I did the Eduardo Di Filippo play, and that was a big thing because he's a god there. And after, you know, people really, I didn't realize what a god he is there, like him and Toto. And, and they really were very, very receptive to what we did because we were innocent in our approach. I couldn't, I was not trying to imitate Di Filippo because I didn't know him well enough to do that, you know what I mean? Or be intimidated by it. But when I had to do this famous coffee speech in the play, I was like, whoa, this is, you know, these people are going to be judging me. But they were really, uh, they, they loved what we did. And uh, so that kind of broke the ice, I think, in a big way. And uh, they were very happy that I was there. And I spent a couple of years researching it with a Neapolitan, uh, Federico Vacalebre, who's a journalist and a musicologist. And I met many of the singers. And many of the singers, I did not know what they looked like until I, I liked their music. And then I met them. And, uh, you know, they all were very powerful personalities. You know, they, you know, everyone, like, for example, they were not, Fiorello, who's a big comic there, does one of our songs, Caravan Patrol. And one of the other big singers, Massimo Ranieri, he was he's Neapolitan. He said, well, why are you putting, you know, uh, Fiorello? He's Sicilian. Why are you putting him in the movie? And I said, well, Naples was the king of two Sicilies. So <laughs> uh, I said, because I want it to be representative. I said, it's, you know, there are there are great singers like Mina or from the past, Gabriella Ferri, who was a great Roman singer. And she sang many great Neapolitan songs. So I didn't want to be limited, you know, to that. And, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, we took it from there. Right here. The gentleman there. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Eugenio Benato? Uh, because my family's from southern Italy, and they would send me... Uh, YouTubes of uh, Pietro Montecovino, right. Eugenio Benato, they're really uh, proponents of southern music from yeah. Naples right they down are. to the tip of Sicily. They That's do a right. lot of songs for, right. uh, for El Mezzogiorno, Meridionale. Yeah. Right. They have a song called The Gran Sud. That's right. They're basically the same history. They were conquered by so many people. And, right. uh, well, they were married. They, they were married, both of them. I mean, they they're still, I think, live together. But they're no longer married, so uh, she's really wild. Yeah, she's, she's like. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, yeah. if that, I thought I said, "Who's this Strega?" The first yeah. time I she's, saw her, uh, she's very powerful. She's powerful. a very. She's actually a very nice person, but she's oh, yeah. like someone said that she. What did they say about it? They compared it to Janis Joplin. She makes Janis Joplin yeah. look like Perry Como. Like Perry yeah. Como they said. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, when I first met Petra, yes, his brother is also his brother is uh, a musician too and very well known too. Uh, Eugenio's brother. Oh really? Yeah. And, uh, but he is really real. I really love his arrangements. And M. Barca Bentalab in the movie, who's from Tunisia, who's lived there for 20 years, she worked with him for 10 years and sang backup to Petra. But mm -hmm. Petra wanted to be the, the protagonista of the film. Oh, she I did? Yeah. She goes, Yo sono protagonista. Yeah, that voice. Protagonista. Yeah. Is, 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 yeah. And she said, I'm going to make you. I, I don't know how he says, I want to make you, he said, yo, yo, uh, 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 I want to make you forget uh, the dimenticare. Right? Uh, fate dimenticare. Fate, yeah, 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 fate dimenticare, uh, tu addio, your God. I want to make you forget your God, she told me. <laughs> I was like, did you say I want, I, I was really like, wow, this is, uh, she's pretty fucking, she's, you know. And then uh, I said, well, maybe I'm not religious, you know what I mean? I, said, I don't know how religious I am. But she just was trying to shock me. That was her Neapolitan way of saying, and she was very easy to work with. She was, uh, she was really, really, really easy to work with, and, and very powerful performer. I love to use her again in something. Uh, John, I would like to bring up a stereotype. In Italy, among Italians, Neapolit uh, Naples has the reputation for being a dysfunctional city where nothing right. works, where everything is chaotic. Right. What was it like working there? Was uh, it so? I, I thought the people were incredibly, uh, you know, hardworking, the people I worked with, and uh, accommodating. Uh, you know, in a lot of areas that get dumped on, they get dumped on not just from the people who take advantage of them, whether it's politicians or the Gamora, uh, but for example, you know, not all their garbage problems are created by them. They, they receive it from other places. So they're the recipients of this still. Yes, 
there are, there is, they had a very strong mayor for a long time, and then he left and kind of got absorbed into the system. So what you see is these hardworking people having to navigate all these twists and turns of people, like even on the set, like there were guys who would show up on the set, like what's going on? And they obviously were, you know, guys from other walks of life. And I immediately would just go up to them. I said, listen, we don't have a lot of money and blah, blah, blah. And if, you know, uh, if I was introduced to them as a boss, I would talk to them. And I immediately asked them, I said, do you want to be in the movie? I just said, do you want to be in the movie? You know, I said, oh, Bella Fauci, you know, I put you in the movie. You want to be in the movie? And they were like, some were like, no, I don't want to be in the movie. You know I mean? <laughs> and some guys wanted to be in the movie. And some guys just wanted to, you know, to, to strut their stuff in front of, and then they usually would go. I mean, we didn't have a lot, but uh, they just don't want to be, the corrupt things, they don't want to be bothered. They don't want you to interfere with what they're doing. But I, I, didn't, I found that a lot of the people are really struggling to survive. And that was very moving to me. And those are the people I did a movie for, you know? I had people telling me I had to hire certain singers and things like that who were horrendous singers. And I was like, no, there's no way. I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. You know, and guys trying to, you know, strong arm me a little bit. But uh, we, we weren't paying anyone anything, really. So, uh, you know. Because this movie was actually done on a very tight budget. Yeah. I mean, we did this movie in 21 days, which is a miracle. It's a miracle. I mean, and we shot 23 songs and we interviewed people and, I mean, we really, you know, when Italians function well, they're really fast, you know? <laughs> the French can say they're really fast, but the Italians are really fast. It's true. I mean, I work with the crew, they are fast as lightning, you know, because they want to eat afterwards. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but they are fast and they do things and they understand how to adapt. And you, when you get a great, we have Marco Pontecorvo was my DP and Simona Paggi was my editor. You couldn't work with two better people, you know, and they do everything for you. And a lot of times, because sometimes the system isn't as organized, people have to do two or three jobs, you know. So no, I think every stereotype in the world, is there's reasons for it. And obviously, you know, people want to be comfortable saying this is what people are. And, you know, unless you kind of break it apart and you get specific about it, you understand this is a universal condition. You know, people are human. And uh, anytime you can break it apart, it, it, it's, a, it's a service because then people are more open-minded. That's all. A movie in 21 days, did San Gennaro have anything to do with this miracle? San Gennaro has a lot to do with it. <laughs> I'm very, very uh, superstitious now. Very. Because when, we, when it was going to rain, the clouds held. You know, when Mesia sang indifferentemente in a city like Naples, it was a Saturday, no horns during full take of the song. I was like, this is not possible. And uh, so the people are really, they really are superstitious. They believe in all kinds of things because they had to, you know. I mean, San Gennaro, they, they, they pray to them to protect them from natural disasters you know at one time they went against Saint Gennaro and uh, they, they thought he collaborated with the French and they brought in a new saint and he didn't work <laughs> so they brought him back that's true that's true but uh, you know what, what you feel when you're in a city like that is that you feel like the history not of all of mankind but you kind of feel the history of humanity in a place like that you just feel it and you're like wow it's on the people's faces and I, I recognize things of cities that I've worked in, like New Orleans, you know, or New York at a certain time, uh, you know, Rio, you know. Uh, so, you know, it's just one of those, it's one of those special places. And, uh, you know, you could, people, you could spend 40 years there and you'd still be just, you know, finding new things out all the time. And that's how it is when you go anywhere that's interesting, really. And I think that's what I learned. Like, you know, I didn't try to make a movie summarizing Neapolitan music. That's an impossibility. You know? <laughs> it really is. Part of me feels that it's almost a, more a movie about theater than, than music. I mean, it's both, but, I, I don't but know, there's yeah. a lot of 
theatricality sure. in it. That's right. And a lot of subtlety, too. And a lot of irony, you know? It's not just people being emotional. <clears throat> they actually make fun of their emotions. Well, they make fun of the, the political situation because they have to. You know Questions? First, I would like to congratulate you on this film. I really enjoyed it. And I just, uh, you mentioned history in your re uh, remarks, and I was just wondering, uh, I saw a lot of uh, documentary clips from Instituto Luce, yes, and I just wondered uh, what was your logic for selecting those clips? Because I would think also you could probably have picked up, you know, like actual classic films like The Sica, The Gold of uh, yeah, uh, Napoli, yeah. and well, so right. if you can. I was trying not to put other movies in the movie. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that would be helpful because then you're, I don't want to make an academic exercise because I, once again, I think if you do a song, there's all different ways of doing it. You could, you could show the people on the street while you, you know, uh, uh, playing the song. So I, I chose things that had references to the songs that we, was Pistol Packing Mama or Tama Moria Tanira. Uh, I didn't want to have too much old footage, but I preferred the black and white because the camera work is superior. When I had great singers in the 70s, in color, the camera work was horrible compared to like, I couldn't find a great clip of Murillo when he was young. I looked everywhere, but it was all in the 70s. And I wanted him when he was young. The Sergio Bruni clip is, you know, it's a, it's a fabulous clip, you know. Anything that was in black and white, because they had the big cameras, they had the big tracking shots, it's really beautifully, beautifully done. So we had other things, too, that we didn't use. So many great singers I wanted, you know, to, to use. But, you know, if you did another movie, you could, you could do that. But hopefully their spirit pervades our film and informs our film. Because if you have a great singer, he maybe has influenced another singer, you know. And, uh, and, and that's basically it. I, I wasn't trying to be so logical you know, I have one of the numbers in front of uh, Caravaggio, Seven Acts of Mercy. And the reason I, I'm a big Caravaggio fan, but I thought it, it, it looks like a street scene from Naples. It really does. And, uh, we, you know, playing this beautiful, you know, uh, guitar, uh, Fausto Giuliano, and he does Catari. And uh, I thought that would be a nice, because it's like something that would happen there, you know. And so I wasn't... I just chose what we needed, basically. But we looked through a lot of things. And, and the, uh, the museum in Bologna also was very helpful. They gave us some beautiful, beautiful things, you know, post-war things. Uh, Thank John, you. you worked on, on how many movies, more or less? Uh, I don't know. Okay. 70 movies. And yet, yeah, 70 movies, more or less. And yet you said that this was by far the most exciting project you worked on. Well, I, I think it's one of the most exciting groups of, pe of talented people I have ever been around because they're all musicians and they can all really, they're all really excellent at what they do. And because of the limitations of the budget to see what we could do, it, it could have been a, a disaster. And so every day that we got something, it was like a little miracle. And I was, it just reminded me of what attracted me to be in this profession. You know, when people are really expressing themselves as part of a group, they're not above the group. They're in the group. They're in the ground. You know, we kind of like, like to idolize people and put them on these pedestals. But when you see someone, the, the, the expression is coming this way, it, just, it does something to you. And it also makes you feel like less, it makes you feel less alone as a person. And so maybe it's just time of my life or whatever, but... Uh, you could watch the movie many times and you have different experience, uh, emotional reactions to it because you're filling in the song. You know, it's not like a story manipulating you, telling you how to feel. You feel the way you want to feel. With it. And uh, it just was, it's one of those movies that it was, it was a great thing to be involved with. I'm really, really, you know, privileged to be a part of it. Other questions? Hi, I haven't seen the movie yet, but from the clip that you showed, um, you had the title of the song in English and in Italian, and I was half expecting to see subtitles for the song. Some of the, the songs lyrics. are subtitled. This is going to be my question. Is Some. Were, the, were the lyrics discussed in the film? Yeah, or they yeah. You, you, you see plenty of lyrics. This okay. song, because it's so whatever, I decided 
to Simona, my editor, she said, you know, John, I think maybe this is more of a, a lower body experience. And I said, uh, <laughs> uh, I, no more uh, questions. Yeah, I, I, and I said, uh, you know, I, I said, you know, I agreed with her. I said, I think you're right. I think we go without that one. But yes, there is. Uh, since the um, lady asked a question about the movie and you have not seen it yet, maybe this is a good moment to bring in the next clip. Um, and the song is Marutzaila, and maybe you want to introduce a little bit what we're about to see. Well, this song was really an experimental song because we, 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 this is a song that we added and we didn't know exactly how we were going to shoot it. But maybe you should see it first. And then uh, we'll talk and, about and then it. we can talk about it, yeah. Okay. What? Just, it just shut off. It just uh, shut off? All right. Well, let's talk about it. <laughs> we, 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 or we, if you prefer, no. we can take a question and then we'll... Yeah, we'll see if you can get it on. But it was... Uh, this was not a Corey... There it is. Oh, where to begin to talk about this clip? <laughs> well, th this song uh, we couldn't do live for a lot of reasons, but he sang along, and then we kind of mixed it a little bit. But uh, this song, you know, is a famous song. Uh, Renato Carasoni wrote the song, and uh, we were going to do these other versions of it, and I didn't really like it. And I heard this guy, Gennaro Cosmo Parlato, who actually is a fan he's a fantastic singer. He's a songwriter too. And he just has a new album out called La Terra Mia, which is based on the Pino Daniele song. And so we decided to do it, and all I knew was I was going to have him start it in a mirror that was sort of hanging in a little chicken coop by the beach uh, across from that decayed building. And after that, we were like, well, 
what do we do after that first shot in the mirror when he sings? So we did him coming down the stairs. And then we went over to the beach. I said, well, what's going to happen when he sings, you know, on the beach? I said, uh, what are the people going to do, you know? And the guys in the bikinis, you know, were older than me, and they looked great, actually. And uh, they just stood there, like, just, they were in the scene, like, ah, this poor guy singing about his chick and stuff like that and whatever. <laughs> And they didn't react. So I asked the guys on the crew, I said, well, how come no one is reacting? You know, why is no one turning around or looking at the camera? He said, well, this, this is Napoli. This, this, is, this is normale. This, for us, it's nothing unusual. There's nothing unusual. So when I saw that, I was really, you know, and then we just kept adding to it whenever we had a little chance because we didn't have enough shots for the scene. And then the, the lovers in the scene, that's my casting lady, Nunzia, and my cinematographer, Marco. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. And so they did it, and we, were, you know, and we, we set it up, and all the guys on the crew was, were, were criticizing Marco's love technique. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but she was great. She's married. She said, I'd do it, no problem. She just said, you know, I don't want to And she's beautiful. You know? So we, like, we said, OK, Nunzia is going to do it. So a lot of the girls in the movie are our uh, you know, makeup girl, or our photographer, location manager, and they're all in the movie, all of them. And they all participated. So this was really uh, something that we, we kind of scotch taped together and improvised through it, not knowing if it would work or not. Other things we knew, but uh, you know, it really came out, really, it's really fun. So, but are uh, you saying that the scene at the beach was one take? Uh, no, we did a couple takes. But they just, the guy kept standing there in the bikinis, those two guys. <laughs> and they never moved. I was like, these guys are perfect. You know? And then that one guy was like, get away from me. He, didn't like, he really was like that, the guy. But we didn't have a sound on him. And uh, yeah, no. We had one, one old woman extra. Those are all just regular, they're just looking at him. I'm like, what are you going to do? What can we do? The guy's singing. It's no big deal. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that, I'm just saying, is really fantastic. When you're in that realm, if you can't be creative, you, you, you know, you're saying, well, this is why you know, they had their own film industry. You know, they, they're the ones who created. I mean, people think music videos were created here. They created the Shanajata, which is they built a story around the song. They did that on purpose because singers got taxed more than actors, so they wanted to be considered actors. They're the ones who built it. They made so many movies built around songs. They're, you name a title of a song, Marozella. There's movies, Marozella. And so they, they, they invented that genre in the theater first, where they would make a story around a song. So it was almost like a little music video, you know, around it. So uh, they find their ways of, of doing it. But like I said, everybody's an actor there. I mean, anybody. You can get anybody who's good. You know, I mean, r rarely bad. But they had their own industry. And some of the great actors and directors you know, come from there. And there's a reason why. Because to be good there, you, you know, it's competitive. <laughs> it's competitive. So, you know. Yes, there's a question yeah. there. Yeah, um, thank you for this amazing film. I just had questions about the background of two of the songs. The one about oil and the one with um, Lavandai, the washer. Canto delle lavandai del Vomero is from 1300. Okay. It's an anonymous uh, author, and we shot it in a Roman aqueduct live. Uh, and that's considered the first popular Neapolitan song. Uh, it's a song that the washerwomen would come from up the hill, come like fairies, wash everybody's clothes in the city, and then disappear. And they used that tune to sing, tell lots of other stories, not just about you know, the, the washerwomen. Sometimes they told all different love stories, uh, love consummated, love frustrated, using the same melody. Uh, but that is considered the first popular song from 1300. Mm. Uh, and the Caravan Patrol was written after the war by Renato Carasone. And, you know, fuel was, I guess, th there was a, a need for fuel. And, of course, in his inimitable, ironic way, they're trying to find American petrol uh, in Naples, so the guy buys a camel and a turban, and he goes looking for oil. And uh, that's the genesis uh, you know, of the song. But obviously, there was all this American you know, ga you know, gasoline, American cigarettes, all these things. 
And so he wrote that song in the 50s. And he was kind of like a bebop guy, great piano player, and a, and a really wonderful composer. The, the choice of music in Naples is endless. How did you manage to actually keep it manageable within 23 cuts? It was very cuts? hard. It was very hard. It was very, very hard. And uh, we kept changing our minds. Even, you know, like I said, I, I knew with James Senese, once I met him, to do Passione and then to do Tama Moriata Nira in the middle of the movie. I knew I, was, I would have that. But, you know, I, I had a lot of strong women around me and I would take votes. <laughs> no, I had decided a bunch of the songs, but when I, when, I, when I couldn't decide something, I would ask them, tell me, I like this song, what do you think? And they would say, that's, that's good. You know, that's not good. And we were trying to take the cliche and you know, break it apart and investigate it. And uh, so it was, it was not easy. And then we had to balance, you know, a slow song, a fast song, powerful song, ironic song. So not every song, I'm, you know, there are a few arrangements that I wish were a little different because sometimes they were delivered late. But there were things I knew from the beginning, like Come Faccia Tamamata, I wanted that from the beginning. Vesuvio, I always wanted that song. Uh, and, uh, and this is a great song. And this, this guy, is a, he, he's a huge talent. He's a really big talent. So, uh, yeah. Um, I know going into making a, a documentary, you go in with sort of an idea of what you hope to, to get out of it as, as the director, as the mm -hmm. director, producer. Um, so what was that original concept? And then what was the... What did you come out of it? I, I mean, I knew, I knew what the songs in the middle of the movie, what I wanted, but I didn't really know exactly. I wanted to see, the, you know, once you put a camera on someone, you see how evocative they are and what they can convey. A great singer is a great storyteller. He doesn't need a million cuts or she doesn't need a million cuts. That's the difference when someone can hold. And it's a different kind of performance style for, uh, when, you, when there's a big camera on you. You know, if it's if you're just singing for the for the rafters, and it's like you're doing like a big concert thing, you, if you're going for the jugular every moment, you can kill a movie that way. You you couldn't have singers that sang that way, because they would be they would have been too much. They would have maybe been good in the moment. So we were trying to find singers that they were you know coming from a deeper place in certain in certain in certain songs. I didn't want to have too many tragic songs either because that's just too exhausting. But there would be some, you know, uh, songs of, you know, regret or whatever. Uh, but uh, I, what was thrilling about it was I didn't know. And that was a big lesson for someone my age to say, huh, wow, this is something to learn. And that really was a real Neapolitan lesson for me say, okay, be open to the moment. I, I've chosen a lot of good songs, but there were a lot of songs that pushed their way into the movie, a lot of them. And uh, I'm very uh, happy that I was open to do that. Because everyone wants to be open, but it's hard to be open, especially when you worked on something. This is not the inside of my head. Maybe the attack on certain songs is, you know, uh, but... I was trying to receive a culture too, a little bit, and, and respond to it, like a call and response. And that's what the movie is, is a call and response for me. As an Italian living in this country, I, I often notice how Italy is presented sugar-coated. It's all la dolce yeah. vita. Right. Everything is, is beautiful about Italy. You manage to to present Naples much more real. It's Naples, it's not necessarily always pretty in your images. I, I, I'm not interested. I, I'm not interested in, 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 in pretty things. I'm not. I, I'm interested in things that are evocative. Uh, you know, I see these movies, they're all set in Tuscany or whatever, and it's like I just want to go to sleep and, I, and, and just go to sleep. You know, I, I'm not interested in it. It doesn't interest me. I'm interested in, 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 in human, you know, in humanity. And it can be all different cultures, you know. And so the films I've loved from Italy have explored that. 
And uh, I think once again, that's just like a stereotype. You know, Italians have, you know, they have a big, you know, there's a lot of visitors there, and, and obviously, you know, uh, tourism is a big business for them. But I'm attracted to places that the tourists aren't there, you know, because you can get the real sense of the country and, and what people really value and the rhythm of a place, you know, the rhythm of it. So uh, it's just what you're interested in. And that doesn't, you know, I don't come from that. You know, I, I came from, you know, simple place. So that I, I have a connection to it. And, uh, you know, I like being in those places, those kind of places, because I feel comfortable. And to me, it's just as beautiful as being in this lush countryside. I try to avoid all those big shots of the bay and all this stuff, you know. If I could have shot inside the volcano, I would have, you know. So, yeah. I can't help but think of uh, neorealism of music. Yeah. For Napoli. That's it. And uh, that's what I think makes it very dynamic. That's, that's, and that's what I'm in. I that, absolutely loved it, and it was great. And I love that singer singing in uh, Oh Solo Mio in Arabic. Uh, that was so fun. But she's a wonderful singer. Yeah, and she was And she's great. A, beautiful, a beautiful person, too. And I really uh, I hope this is going to help her career and stuff. But, so. but I think that's why it's standing on its own so strong. Right. Because you've got all this neorealism. I and mean, you went out there and looked for. Well, you know, those, those, those kind of films, in whatever culture that made those films, and Italian culture did a lot of those films, uh, you know, they, those, they remain you know, potent Absolutely. examples of it, not only putting a, a, a spotlight on a social condition, but also uh, being really evocative stories. Absolutely. Too. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Rafael, uh, Rafael La Capria wrote a big article about this, and he's written all these films with uh, Francesco Rosi. And when I read what he wrote about it as a Neapolitan and as a famous author, he said, you know, he was rediscovered some of you know, where he came from. So sometimes it's good when someone has a little distance and you're just a great audience for it. You know, you're just, you're receiving it. So, uh, but those films are in my head. And that's what Francesco Rosi told me. He said, the film, the, the, the music in places like this, he said, come out of the ground, come out of the walls, and come out of the, those people's faces. And that's what you should concentrate on. Last question. Two yeah. questions <laughs> quickly. <laughs> Please. Uh, could, you, could you tell us uh, how did you bring uh, to the film a singer which you call Misia and I would call Misha? Thank you. Okay, well, you call Misha. <laughs> I, so I call her Misia. That's, uh, that's how she says it to me. So uh, she, she's Portuguese Fado singer. She's worked in, in, in Naples a lot. Uh, she loves Naples. And she had recorded this song with Avion Travel but they had never met. <laughs> and uh, Federico Vacalebre recommended her, and uh, I really have to thank him, because I'm really indebted. But then I added a song I gave her, Indifferentemente, because I thought she was extraordinary. Another question there? Uh, yeah, I wanted to make a comment about um, something you brought up uh, just a question or two ago about um, Tuscany. And um, I, it's very... I think about it more in this discussion and because of the movie, uh, I'm a 100% Italian, Southern Italian uh, myself, third generation. And I noticed that people here, um, they, they talk about Italy itself as so beautiful, Tuscany, it's so wonderful. The Italian food is so terrific, the artists you know, and, the, and the singers. And yet when it comes to talking about Italian people, there really is still, um, uh, the stereotype, very big stereotype, you know, they're, they're wops or they're greasy Italians or they're lazy and it's even hard, I, I never understood it until I moved to San Diego, <laughs> where there isn't really an Italian-American community that I had fit into and you almost have to change your personality in, able, in order to be able to interact with people because otherwise you're seen as volatile or temperamental or over-enthusiastic or over-affectionate because, you know, maybe uh, you see somebody, you want to kiss them, you know, uh, you want to hug them goodbye or, or something. And they're uh, just like, wait. So, you know, 
And then you meet someone who's, who comes from the East Coast and is specifically Italian, and I change, my entire attitude changes. I relax, I'm content and happy, I'm yelling, and nobody's backing, the guy isn't backing away. <laughs> so I, I feel like I've somehow, with this, I, you know, you said something about loneliness before, I, I feel okay again, you know, yeah. like I, well, I do have a place. Well, that's why I made the movie, you know, I mean, and that's not just for people from there. I mean, I think it's, you can call it a Latin music, you can call it a, you know, a, a hot weather country a film, you know what I mean? You could call it a lot of things. And there's a lot of people there. So there's, you know, I've been affected by all the different cultures. You know, I could listen to, you know, certain black music that I love or, or, or Cuban music or Spanish music. And I feel like, well, that's my music. That's my music too, you know, because it does something to me. And some of these people do the same thing. So I think any body who isn't really from a certain background feels those what feels those things, and uh, instead of complaining about it, you got to go got to go out there and mine your culture, and then see what's also universal about it, you know, and what's human. So, you know, but I know what it is. It's like it's nice to feel, you know, that okay, I can express myself. And uh, everyone's going to say, it's no big deal. Like the guy on the beach <laughs> singing his song. You know what I mean? Nobody reacted. You know, I, was, I, I felt like a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. I was like, how come no one's reacting? <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, and, uh, you know, it was very, I was very English in my approach. But I'm sure the English people would really love that too. So we, we all need a little, you know, balance. So, yes. Hi, I wanted to say thank you so much for talking with us tonight. Um, You're welcome. I'm looking forward to seeing the film a little bit later. And um, I just wanted to comment that without having seen it, it the, the title sounds perfect because I just feel your passion coming through well, so strong about the, the, the music, the people that you met, the place. It, it's, it's just the wonderful. The music is a great thing. It's a really healing thing. Mm. It's like the best part of people. I if agree. all those politicians right now could sing some nice songs, you know what I mean? <laughs> maybe they would learn to harmonize a little bit. You know I mean? my, my question was, um, do you have another project in the works? Well, I got to beat my little drum <laughs> for this film. Uh, uh, yeah, I have other things too. And obviously they're doing a concert tour, so I'm going to go see it. I, my, one of my goals is to bring them over here. That's a goal of mine, and I really want to bring them over here because uh, it would be a great, a great thing. You know, years ago they would have all different ethnic music, and actually, at BAM, uh, at the Opera House, Sergio Bruni sang there, and Massimo Ranieri was his opening act as a little boy. And so I, I really want to get them over here. So, uh, but yeah, I have, I have other things I want to do, and uh, but this is something that's. Uh, you know, it's worth the time for me. Yeah, well, they're in the concert. They're amazing. That's that's Monica Pinto, is that uh, the singer? She's she's the greatest. You know, she's really uh, a, be a beautiful group. I would like to I conclude agree. with a, a, a brief observation. Did you notice John's reaction to the clip of of Maruzella? How? You were enjoying it as if you had you were seeing it for the first time, and I think that that really is passione. Well, you know, when something's good, it is good. So, what can I say? The guy's good. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you very thank much, you very and much. thank you all of you.